Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live on Mars? That's the premise behind Million on Mars, a new NFT game that's inspired by the real life race to colonize the red planet. I'm Amy Jo Kim, and today we're talking with Mitch Zamara, the game designer behind Million on Mars. Mitch is an expert in game economies, a skill he first honed while working on free-to-play games at Zynga. Let's listen to Mitch explain the economy of this innovative play-to-earn game. So, Million on Mars is out now. Tell us about it. Yeah, so we've been working on, on Million on Mars Land Rush for the better part of six months now. We've finally gone live. We now have play-to-earn components where you can earn dusk inside of the game, and you can actually withdraw that token to your wallet. You're able to spend it inside of the game on lots of the different features and systems that we have stood up. To me, it's it's been really, really exciting to see a fully player-driven economy come to life. This has been a huge, exciting opportunity to build something this fresh and, and unique, in which everything that you do inside of this game is is fully player driven. We are, are truly trying to do our best to give as much autonomy for effort and value and work to, to the players themselves. And we aren't just trying to recreate the wheel from the sort of old free to play days. So where does money come from? Outside of the game, we sell packs of NFTs, which are blueprints and land. Those blueprints can be deposited inside of the game and can be turned into a developed piece of virtual Martian real estate. So you deposit your land deeds into the game and you can claim a plot. You can deposit your building blueprints into the game and install a greenhouse, some solar panels, a water filter, and a CAD, and you basically have all the fundamentals needed to survive on Mars. What things get interesting about this is that anyone who owns land in the game has far more work they need to get done than they have the built-in sort of stamina to do on a given day. And in our old days of doing free-to-play games, you would just sell people more energy or more stamina. You'd just say, refill it for five bucks or whatever we would do. But even your stamina and your time inside of our game is also decentralized in our economy, meaning that everyone has the same restrictions on their stamina and the amount of work that they can do per day. And this isn't a rule that is broken. And what instead you can do is that if you need more things done than you have stamina for, you can hire players inside of the game to do the work for you instead. And so we've built in an actual work system in which you can post jobs and players can take jobs and you pay them for the work and they do the work inside of the game and you get the actual resources. And so we are actually modeling real world economic systems inside of this game by having an actual player driven work economy in which there are employers and employees effectively like virtually sort of simulating these experiences within the game i mean you don't have to like you're not like sitting in the virtual coal mine having to work you know 20 hours a day or anything like that you're really just pushing a button but what happens is the actual unique live feeling of this economy really starts to manifest when the system came into place and it's accelerated by the fact that all the stamina and all the work that players do only happen when the players are eating food and drinking water and all the food and water also has to be produced by the players in the economy. So there is no free lunch, basically. You have to be an, a participant in the game. You have to be part of the economy to really get the most out of it, or it will continue moving on without you, really. So why are you breaking those free-to-play conventions? Because I follow you. Is it because of the economy and the way you want to set up your flows and sinks and all that stuff? We don't auto refill your energy every day. We break a lot of the conventions of free to play games, but make sure that the game itself is still accessible. For example, we don't have a completely free to play game because unfortunately are inviting a lot of exploitation and bad actors right now. This is something that we've seen on the wax chain. It's something we've seen in other games like Mirror 4. I think Mirror 4 said they banned on the order of several million accounts, botting and automating behavior. And to me, this is what happens when you have a completely open-ended entry right now. I want to strive a low entry price floor of just needing to have like a membership badge to get into the game. And that way the cost for bad actors becomes exponentially expensive over time, especially early on when they're trying to pull our token out of the game and make money. It's, it's not going to be ROI positive because every account that we're banning is costing them $10. If you keep all of your resources open-ended, you just march down a path of hyperinflation. And whatever path of least resistance exists, 
whatever minimal, maximal, optimizable path exists, the players will take advantage of it. Tarn Johnson's old adage, players will optimize the fun out of their own game, very much rings true here. If you provide those means to min-max in any way, the player will make that the only way they play the game. And so you have to basically put restrictions on everything. So in your game, what can you pay to get better at or get ahead at? Right now, the way that you would sort of pay to get ahead is you would become a landowner. The landowners effectively have the stronger advantage in our meta. They are the sort of more invested player inside of the game. And we're going to be releasing new buildings over time and new content over time that sort of evolves things and changes the game as it grows. Our overall goal will be to roll out a skill system so that there's actual room for specialization. And so it's not that everyone can do every type of work or task anymore. It'll be that everyone can do the basic tasks of growing food or, or you know, maintaining or filtering water because they're the basics. But when it comes to mining and processing, forging, smelting, manufacturing, all these like advanced technical, advanced skills, we want to wrap all of this around a progression system so that players have to make choice and they have to specialize and that the quality and quantity of these players who can do these things actually becomes a lot more scarce. And so players who invest their time actually can really see a, a return on that investment of their time and their efforts playing inside of the game. It will be such that as the game progresses, you won't be able to just hire anyone to do a job task. You might need a level five miner to, to go mine deep inside of your land and you might have to pay more resources to have that done, but they're going to be able to get more rare resources in return for you as, as the person hiring them for the work. So basically specialized labor commands a higher value because there's less competition and it always goes relative to demand. So if players are needing specific resources, they need a new blueprint, they need an upgrade, they need certain parts in the game, they're going to have to pay more to get that produced and they can they have to pay for the specialized labor inside of the game economy to have it made so our goal is to actually over time to sell less things directly to our players and instead put the value creation in the hands of our players we want our players crafting nfts crafting items and we would rather put a small fee on those efforts that we monetize from instead of being the ones selling primarily to our players to us this ensures that supply and demand is self-regulated and that the players drive that themselves they make the things they need the most they sell off the excess supplies to each other um, and they self-regulate their own needs. And for us, our goal is to just stand up more and more systems, more and more loops, more and more ways to sync resources. Psychologically, you've talked about like the land game in a million on Mars. Then you yep. say, oh, there's going to be all these people and they scale up and they, you know, get hired. Who are these people that have all this time and don't want to buy land? So what's interesting is that our player base is very international and it has been from the get-go. Some of our bigger emerging markets are Eastern Asia, South America, and in Russia, of course. We have an interesting intersection because we're space, because we're Mars, because we're blockchain and play to earn. We cover a, a very broad spectrum in different areas in which there's interest. So a lot of people who are into futurism and into space travel and being a multi-planetary society, you know, those things just echo in, in what we're building. One of our main characters in the game is named Leon Dust. No relation to any other current known your spacefaring uh ceo billionaires try right? just pure pure coincidence so so we very much are ears to the ground we care much a, a lot about being relatively close to being scientifically accurate to feel like there's a high degree of realism in what we're building lots of things are still gaming in a lot of sense like you grow coffee in two days not four years like there are certain things that i won't go hardcore on the realism but for the sake of the game they still fit in well and we want to really kind of make this as a great way for people to learn about science and technology and, and the future of where we're heading while also being able to play a really compelling and enjoyable game experience so for me the people around the world that are playing this want something that's low friction that's easy to play that isn't high contact really about making smart choices and not about just you winning and someone losing so there is no conflict in the game there is no fighting you are basically taking jobs doing work, scavenging for resources, buying and selling the things you need and don't need, and being part of this live breathing economy that everyone is participating in. And as we add more to this over time, people will get ways to spend more time inside of the game, to have more expression, to have more advancement. We definitely want to make as much of the game and the systems as accessible to as many people as we can as it grows as well. It is very much drawn to build economic simulations of, of settling on Mars, 100%. The name Million on Mars is intentional. I really want to see this game grow to have millions of people in this virtual economy that we're building. And there's enough room for all the systems and specializations and all the content that we're going to build to accommodate that player base. 
So this game sounds amazing. It's make it a great game first. It's pulling in a very international audience that has something interesting that they share. And it's a play to earn game. So walk me through somebody in Southeast Asia who's playing this play to earn. What does that look like? And are there like a couple of key personas there? The two sort of standout things that I've seen in the last just couple of weeks are simple casual players that just play the game that are earning dusk that take it out and are able to convert it into wax. The other scenarios that I've seen are the players that have been earning dusk and are able to then use it to supplement what it would cost to buy a land. And so we've seen players that are advancing from workers to landowners, and then they're able to then provide work for other players. The low barrier to entry in the game also allows players to get their friends in relatively easily as well. And so we're seeing this sort of like, hey, I sent access badges to my friends and now they're playing and now they're becoming landowners and they're working together. Like that's really what we're seeing very organically is this sort of emergence of everyone's just sort of like bringing each other in like one by one and, and, and onboarding more friends, more communities and more groups. It really fits the spirit of what we're building. Kind of sounds like you've got large scale co-op going on. It is in a, in a weird sort of indirect way. I mean, everyone is still hiring each other and buying and selling things. But in our Discord community, it is an active, live bazaar of people that are wheeling and dealing NFTs and in-game resources that are trying to buy and sell different things. They're watching the price trends changing in real time. They're talking about meta strategies. They're speculating about the future based on things that we've leaked. There's just, there's so much going on. It is super, super exciting. It's, it is a living ecosystem and a little microcosm of culture that is starting to really brew inside of this this community. And I'm seeing this in all kinds of like play to earn communities. There's, there's very similar things that I see happen in specific game communities and broader blockchain communities and bigger sort of play to earn stuff. There's sort of different emergences that I see happening. The big buzzwords are community first development in which like that's been our mantra from the beginning we have been open kimono about literally everything that we're building from the beginning um we've talked about what our plans are we're very transparent about our roadmap our progress our failures and everything and i think that it gives your players a level of trust that has not previously been seen in this space or even in games in general we were very much used to being about big marketing tent poles and not really revealing dates or talking about what's in progress for the fear of what will change and what will be different on the time of release and we definitely change it up we're open about things that are different we're open about motivations and what the intent is behind decisions and our audience loves this. They absolutely love this level of transparency and it builds more faith and confidence in what we're building as we continue to deliver and, and hold true to what we're saying. And when you say the price changes, what's determining that and where is it listed? So the players themselves have the ability to withdraw Dusk to their wax wallets and they themselves can create liquidity pools on decentralized exchanges and that will afford them to be able to buy and sell it on swap pools or deal with market book orders similar to all other tokens that are on that decentralized exchange. Um, us ourselves, we don't operate any liquidity pools or hold that token for that kind of purpose. So it's really all driven by the players in the market that determine what the value of Dusk is outside of the game. We are solely focused on just making sure that it has utility and that it is not inflated from an in-game economic perspective. All, all we do is make Dusk matter. That's really our goal as game creators. There's a lot of different ways that everyone does stuff. And our goal is always focused around the game itself. So where can we go to learn more about this? You can go to milliononmars.io and you can just learn about the game there. We have a, a really rich player guide as well. It explains all the features and the systems. We have a lot more coming out that will be added to that. Um, you can also go to milliononmars.com slash discord and join our discord community. So as you can see, a lot of work went into designing Million on Mars and that work never ends. Now that the game is live, the team will keep tuning the economy as it grows to keep the game balanced and fun. We'll be talking more with Mitch in future videos. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And if you want to learn more about the future of NFT gaming, check out this interview with Mitch Zamara and John Radoff. See you next week.